Okay, I think we're doing, we're doing good. So I'm Jim Robb, President of NTSA. Your servant for an hour or so of uh, trying to moderate this prolific panel that we put together. The, the Navy really showed up in the Air Force year, and I think you're going to win <laughs> because there's there's more flag officers in, on site than there are uh, Air Force generals. So that's a that's a pretty strong statement, right, Fred? That's right. Yeah. So I, I recognize Fred Lewis, who is uh, my predecessor here. Gave me the job in uh, 2012, and I, I relieved him in my first squadron at sea on uh, Kennedy, and then I relieved him here at NTSA uh, 11 years ago. So, thanks for all you've done. He really is the foundation builder of all ITSIC. I just keep it going. So, thanks for being there. Uh, we have a great, great panel. I think. Like this morning, we've got a, a variety. So there's, uh, you know, there, there's senior leadership here, and then other pieces of of uh, the enterprise. And I think that, that that's a you know give you a, a good broad swath of what's going on in uh, in this part of uh, aviation and and in the surface community. So I appreciate you being here. I think you'll you'll enjoy the conversation. So we are going to put out question cards. And there'll be people walking around, so you get to interact with these folks. And then the the rules of engagement for the question cards are: one, they have to be respectful, you know, and and two, there has to be a question. So um, I will collect them, and and you know, if you're worthy, you'll you'll get your name and you know. So please help me out with that, and. Uh, your interaction is really important to, to what we do today. So let me introduce the group there. It's really a, a great uh, panel that we have. First of all, we've got Vice Admiral Kitchener. Uh, he's, he's very, you know, he's running the, uh, the fleet, uh, the surface fleet. Uh, he's a surface warfare officer. He commanded uh, John Paul Jones, USS Higgins, USS Princeton and uh, Expeditionary Strike Group 2. So uh, he recently commanded Naval, Naval Surface Force US Atlantic Fleet before he went to uh, the, the bigger job. So we appreciate uh, him being with us today. <laughs> and we have um, Pete Garvin, who I, I have seen all over the country this year, so he's he's getting around, um, and he's the chief of naval education and training. Uh, really important, uh, certainly in, in the wheelhouse of ITSIC, because I mean that's got the name, you know, even got the name in the in the thing. So um, he is a uh, he com he's a VP pilot. He's uh, Commanding Officer VP-8, Commanding uh, Patrol Wing 10, um, and was the 1995 Association of Naval Aviation Pilot of the Year. So he's got that in his bag. So he was also commander, commander of the Navy Recruiting Command, which is kind of important to some of the discussions we have here. So his history may help answer some questions. Uh, commanded a reconnaissance group. Uh, and, uh, and, and then was the 20th Commander of Naval Edu Education and Training Command uh, from July 9th of 2020. Uh, he also had, was the Executive Assistant to the Vice Chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So that's a job if you live through, you know, you're a hero. If you don't, it's a tough one. Uh, next we have Admiral Small, Commander of Naval Information Worker Systems Command, um, and uh, so it's, we're off into a whole different uh, domain. He's he holds a doctorate degree in physics, so he's he's one of these smart people. So watch out. <laughs> Operational uh, tours include plank owner of USS Iwo Jima, and he was. Uh, 
not Operation Iraqi Freedom. He served as the first technical director of the Joint Crew Composite Squadron uh, assembled to, by the Navy to assist in defeating IEDs. So that, that was, I was there and it was a pretty big deal. <laughs> and we, we were really in trouble with uh, a fairly new threat and it came out, a lot of, a lot of folks came out and helped a lot. Uh, as an en engineer, engineering duty officer, He's had a, a tour at uh, Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren, where, and he worked with the Missile Defense Agency, Program Executive Officer for uh, Integrated Warfare Systems, PIWS, which is a, a cross-cutting uh, PEO. Uh, he served as assistant, ex excuse me, exec executive assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, which is a very high uh, Pentagon job for the Navy, but pretty much all the money comes in and out, and there's a lot of scrutiny in there. Uh, he was the program executive office officer for integrated warfare systems as a flag officer, um, and he uh, took command of the uh, Information Warfare Command in 2020. And he's leading a force of 11,000 civilians, communicators information, cyber capabilities, and you know, trying to blend that. So that's, that's hard work, it's uh, difficult, a lot of tribes in that, in that crowd. Uh, so we, we thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, and we have Remmel Verhaeg, and uh, he's uh, enlisted in the Navy in 1984 as an electronic technician. Uh, until his appointment to the Naval Academy. So he started his, you know, boots to the flag kind of program. That's, that's really, really something. Uh, he's a des designated surface acquisition professional, uh, although he commanded the USS Carr. He was executive officer of the USS San Jacinto and uh, was part of the commissioning of the USS Higgins. Uh, he, as we talked about a little while ago, was officer in charge of a Tomahawk afloat planning system uh, in, uh, embarked in USS Vincent. And th these, were, these were really key capabilities that helped us. In, you know, in, when I was in Europe, we were doing business in Bosnia, and so we, these folks, you had to have them, and they had to be, things had to be right. <laughs> and if they were, if it was wrong, it was not good. So. Uh, it was a very important job, so I, I thank you for that. He also served uh, with the Missile Defense Agency and a major program manager for Aegis Ashore. Uh, he was also the commanding officer of Naval Surface Warfare Center at Corona Division. So please, please help me welcome Admiral. <laughs> then we have uh, another special kind of slice of the domains. Um, Rear Admiral Hines is the, the Navy Cybersecurity Division Director, Office of the Chief of Naval, Naval Operations. So that this, this is a, this job probably didn't exist, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, it's another one of these things where the Navy's organizing around the threat, around uh, really important areas. Uh, and I and having great effect. So um, she received her commissioning through the limited duty officer program in 1996, um, and she's had operational uh, assignments in the Seventh Fleet. Uh, she was on the Constellation. And she completed a lot of deployments to the Western Pacific and, uh, and Arabian Gulf, where she participated in Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, community, doing mobile communications teams, explosive ordnance uh, detection, and uh, a lot of really important things. Uh, also assigned to Expeditionary Strike Group, Strike Group 3, where she uh, supported deployments there. So again, a, a specialist, but a real talent. So please help me welcome Tracy Hunt. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Vice Admiral Pitchner, and he's going to start opening remarks for the panel. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Really, um, 
looking forward to all your questions. Uh, so why, why did I come here today? Uh, what am I looking for as the uh, community leader of the surface force? Well, for me, it's, it's about getting ready for the fight. And, uh, you know, that's where all our focus is these days. And in, in the surface community over the last few years, uh, we have made some significant investments in data analytics. Uh, and that's allowed us to really accurately assess uh, the material readiness of our ships. And, uh, and so it tells us where to make the investments. And, you know, those two key areas that we look at right now our one is the equipment, right? That's one of the, we've, we've been able to drill into the systems and understand, you know, where we're shortfalls are in parts. And then the other piece is sailor proficiency, which comes back to training and how we train our people. Um, and so what it's allowed us to do is also, we know we need about, we come up with a North Star where we want to have about 75 ships, 75 mission capable ships available on any given day uh, to execute uh, all the things that we need to do, whether it's from exercises to war plans. Uh, and right now, we, we've kind of plateaued a little bit. And so we're trying to figure out what are the levers we need to pull. And I think one of the key ones uh, that we've been focused on is in training. And so we've done a really good job in investing in waterfront training and our simulators. Uh, and trying to incorporate some of our more advanced sailor training into those areas. Where I think our journey is on, on ready, relevant learning, one of the areas that uh, I assess we haven't been doing as well is probably on a session training back at Great Lakes when we get our new sailors in. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we generate training a more proficient sailor ready to fight quicker without lowering the standards that we set for ourselves. Uh, and we think that'll be an enabler in helping us to get to, you know, that 75 ships. So they're not just serviceable ships, they're actually, you know, high-end, connected war fighting capability that we can put out in the, um, in the Western Pacific. Um, again, we've made significant investments, and I was kind of encouraged today walking around uh, with some of the team that I have, that we've actually been able to connect a lot of the different things already, where, for example, Want to, you know, to get better sailors, we want to measure their proficiency. We want to be able to measure it from when they start out in an A school or a boot camp, when they come to the fleet, when they go to their ship, they do their PQS training, uh, and then we want to be able to document that. So as we put our teams together, we're making sure that we have the right people in the right place. And so if you look at our investments over the last few years, it's been into how we manage our people, how we detail them to, you know, so we're putting the right experience on the ships that need more experience and not just detailing everyone to the one good ship. Uh, and, and then being able to document that training, not only for the personnel side, on the training side, uh, so we can actually understand uh, where everyone is. And then we've been able to start pulling in some of our fatigue management data also. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. And, uh, but the focus is on uh, analytics. I've really shown us the light on where to make the right investments. Uh, and now we're just trying to pull the levers that we can. So over the next year, um, we'll have some significant investments and some more work in, uh, in how we can achieve uh, our goal of 75 ready ships. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Jim. I really appreciate the invitation. I, I feel like uh, I'm a, a three-time offender here at ITSEC, so uh, very much uh, appreciate the invitation and the experience. And every year, get a little bit more out of it, right? And get to feel the sense of urgency that not only we feel up here, but that is felt in industry and, and, and industry has responded. So big thanks to NTSA and ITSEC for having it, us up here, but also a big thanks to our industry partners uh, that are out there that are responding uh, with that sense of urgency because as Admiral Kitchener said it it's all about the fight and I you know I'm not uh, you know tend to be a hyperbolic person when it comes to uh, being overly emotional but that fight is coming it's a question of when not if in my mind um, and my increasing sense of, of feeling both uh, in what we read in open press and others is that uh, there's not a lot of not not a lot of runway uh, before <coughs> that fight is here so the sense of urgency, I think you'll, you'll see that mirrored all the way up and down, and you've probably seen it in all of the panels that you've been a part of. Um, so NETSI, uh, quick switch over to what that is and what we do. So Naval Education Training Command, Naval, uh, so thank our Marine brothers and sisters as well. 
Uh, we obviously train uh, on the enlisted side and on the officer side, uh, Marines as well as, as Navy. Um, so just think everything from the street to the fleet. So we go out and we recruit the best talent that we can possibly find that our, that our country can produce. And we get them through boot camp, forge them into the sailors that we would want them to be. We've just expanded boot camp from eight weeks to ten weeks in response to some of the things that Admiral Kitchener was talking about across all the communities to make a better basically trained sailor. And then we get them through all the A schools, C schools, you name it, schools, all the way to USS First Ship Squadron Submarine. So that's what NETSI does. On the recruiting front, I know this isn't a recruiting symposium, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention recruiting, because if you look around, um, all of uh, DOD and, and industry is having a difficult time recruiting, given the recent environment, the COVID environment, um, and the changes in, in society. Just as an example, if you look at the old curve that talks about the, the target demographic of which there's roughly 200 or 21 million uh, folks that are fitting into the, the age demographic that we typically go for, and then you just follow the chart on down to those that are eligible from, uh, from a, um, a legal perspective um, and eligible from an academic perspective. And then if you get to the last box and you find out who, who among those are propensed to serve, uh, before COVID, it was 13%, so down to 390,000. Um, and after COVID, 9% uh, propensity to serve our military in any shape or form. So that's a, that's a tough nut to crack. Um, and I think you've probably read about it in the, in the news. So we're eager for any help that we can get on the recruiting front. I was talking a little bit earlier, and this may go to a question or two. Um, it's about fishing where we don't normally fish. Uh, we typically have gone back to the same smile on um, East Coast, Gulf Coast, and, and West Coast, uh, because that's that's tend to where we where Navy is, and Navy's known, and Navy produces. We've got to get into those centers of influence that uh, don't know Navy nearly as well, and uh, and really reap the talent that's there, because the talent is there. So that's the recruiting front, and then on the training. So a little bit back to more to subject here. So Center of Mass for uh, for Netsi is <coughs> Ready Relevant Learning. It is the program of record. Um, it is the the way we are getting after the right training, so relevant to the time and relevant to the piece of equipment, to the gear, to what that sailor needs at the right time. So no, gone are the days where you shove it all in at the front of their career and hope to God they remember it in 20 years when they need that piece of information that you shoved in there. In the right way, so think the modality of learning, the way the principles of learning science applied directly. So it's not learning in order to pass a test. It's learning in order to be able to perform a task ideally under pressure, under fire, and be able to do it uh, while, uh, while things are really, really dire. And then at the point of need, and we're really excited about the point of need, and this is a place where industry is already helping but can further help, which is to say um, not all the way back to the schoolhouse always. We'll never get rid of schoolhouse training completely, but the, the more that we can get it to where that shipmate is, uh, the, the better off we are. So um, a couple examples that I'll use one of the improvements in RRL and then one to the point of need of RRL. So the improvements of RRL to the relevance piece, and that actually has to do with the surface rating, so the operations specialist rating. Um, years ago, uh, folks were going through that A school and they would come out of there with a passing knowledge. They might be able to crack the acronym of VMS, Voyage Management System. Uh, While the fleet, obviously, uh, back then it made sense, right? There was only a couple of ships that had it. Uh, well, now just every ship has it. So now OS uh, students go through there, not just, they don't just get a passing knowledge, they get a qualification. So they're value added to their ship when they show up. So that goes to the constant steady improvement, that, that, that fleet feedback, gotta, gotta be really difficult customers um, and make sure that we are, we are producing the sailors that you need. Um, and that goes to the point of need, I'm really excited about just this week, in fact, just yesterday, on USS Abraham Lincoln, uh, a MERTS is underway for the first time. So a multi-purpose reconfigurable training system. Um, a lot of folks in here know what the, exactly what that is or a version like that. And again, a little bit early um, as far as the, the schedule was, but I'll tell you, we're gonna learn an awful lot by getting it out there, getting it underway, and getting it in the hands of sailors. And they can, they can help us validate what we believe about the efficacy of that training <coughs> and where we might need to take it next. What's also really exciting about that is not just aviation ratings. Right, so you got, you got the handlers, so the ABs are on there, ABFs on there, um, those seem obvious, right? But also quartermaster software is on that MERTS. 
Um, part of the ET, so think Slick 32, um, is on that on that MERTS. So it's across all the type commanders that have anything to do with running an aircraft carrier. Um, we're looking for more pilots, probably look for something on the East Coast to, again, uh, get that, that instantaneous feedback so we can tighten that, that OODA loop, if you will, on, on training. Um, and then the last bit, um, it may seem uh, not exactly a training issue, but it really is, goes to uh, what I call um, it's warrior toughness is, is, the, is the name for it. It's just toughness. Um, and folks uh, conflate that, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to share it with you. It is not a resilience program. Um, does it help with resilience? Absolutely. But what warrior toughness is, it's been in run at, at boot camp for about um, three years now, almost four. Um, it's about elite human performance in the now. It is about elevating your game, your ability to fight in the now. So shamelessly stolen from SEALs, who shamelessly stole it from elite athletes, Olympic athletes, professional athletes, and you can see examples of it, of it and you don't know what you're seeing, but, but you're seeing it. Example I like to use is the uh, young lady that skis for uh, China, but somehow lives in San Francisco. Um, she was up at the top of the half pipe, and you could see her visualizing success and controlling her energy, and then she jumps in the pipe and, and she goes. Blue Angels do it too. I mean, so there's all kinds of examples of that. So we're really excited about that. And again, wrapping it back to what the beginning, what we talked about is it's all about the fight. We've got to get these young men and women. We owe them the very best preparation for, uh, for what will likely be a very, very difficult fight. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Abel Small. Hi, uh, so I'm Doug Small. I am the uh, uh, Naval Information Warfare Systems Command Commander. Uh, we are sort of the Navy's geek squad. And um, so, I, you know, out on the floor, I, I had this badge that said NOC TSD, and then I have to say no on my name tag, and they're like, well, what's NAVWAR? It's, so it's kind of like NAV Air, but for information warfare stuff. So think about, uh, you know, networks, communications, stuff like that. Um, we're one of the systems commands. So uh, for me, uh, priorities, um, people's number one priority for, for uh, probably for any leader. Uh, we have 11,000 people. We are in a, an absolute uh, competition for talent, the types of talent that you see out here on the floor. Um, so, you know, the way we get after that, you know, number one is the culture of excellence, right? Treat it, just start with the basics of treat each individual with dignity and respect. Um, we want to create a place where people can't wait to come to work in the morning and work on a mission that is bigger than, than any of us uh, individually. Um, and the mission, you know, I, sense of urgency, all that stuff going into strategic competition. I mean, you come to Nav War to work on, you know, software and things like that, you're working on uh, a, an amazing mission. Um, so, and it, it goes through everything from, you know, how you recruit to retain, promote, every, every single aspect of it. I, you know, we try to set the bar where, where industry sets the bar in terms of how you bring somebody in. We recognize that, you know, getting a security clearance may take some time, but, um, you know, the bar is set by companies like, uh, like a Google or someone who sends you your stuff before you get there and you know exactly where you're supposed to go. And, you know, we say, oh, let's wait 60 days before we communicate with you. It's unacceptable. Um, anyway, so that's that sort of sums up the people side of, of the of my priorities. Uh, readiness and, and these kind of track, uh, you know, obviously to you know, Swole Boss's priorities and uh, CNO's priorities. Readiness number two, um, I, I talk about all the time. Some of you may have heard this, but you know, aceable of 1.0, mathematically impossible, but it's an attitude. If a sailor needs a system to work, the damn thing needs to work. They don't care that the CDD said the ACE of O should be 0 0.80, it needs to work. They're in the, you know, doing a FON op somewhere, it just plain needs to work. And that goes to everything from are they trained <coughs> properly, right? So a lot of the stuff that's out here, are we delivering the proper training so that people can uh, uh, sustain the systems the way they need to be? Uh, designing for self-sufficiency, designing for maintainability, all those sorts of things uh, in the sort of longer term aspects of it. And then the other thing is 100% on time to delivery of systems in avails. We just can't get ships and submarines in and out of availabilities on time. And I certainly never want it to be because of a, a C4I system that's being installed. So that's a, a huge part of, of what we're doing. Um, and then on the sort of the capacity and capability side of the NAV plan uh, initiatives, we summarize it as digitalization. You know, just a recognition that, hey, you know, the world is being eaten by software. Entire industries that used to exist 
are gone and are now sections of software companies, right? It's just, the world has changed so dramatically and I'll just, within the Department of Defense, we are incredibly slow to catch up. So that's kind of our, you know, our third big missionary. <coughs> How do we push ourselves along um, to get better at that? So in that are things like delivering on a new naval operational architecture through Project Overmatch, um, things like that, being data driven in everything we do, so utilizing enterprise data tools, training everybody we have on data analytics up through uh, the beginnings of uh, artificial intelligence, model-based engineering, things. I, I, I cringe when I hear people talk about going through PDRs and CDRs before they start writing software. It just, it still happens out there, but we have got a long ways to go. Uh, digital everything, digital platform, you know, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the wow factor out here, right, is you have a, a platform and, and, and a piece of software that can be, you know, sort of run in, in all these uh, cool platforms. That's what we need to get to, is a place where we separate our hardware and software and are able to move the software at a speed uh, that, that uh, stays ahead of our adversary. So with that, uh, I really look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So go on down to Rebel. Yes, sir. Yeah. You. Hey, me. Um, this is my first, uh, so good afternoon. My first ITSEC, um, um, impressed with kind of the depth and of the, of the, the, the whole program, right? The, the educational piece, the, um, you know, the tutorials, the innovation match game, the exhibits, and, and, and all the like. I was, I was really pleased with it. I thought it was substantive, relevant, and important. And uh, the United States Navy, for sure, benefits um, you know, from this team's effort. So I echo um, Admiral Garvin's uh, expression of appreciation for what industry and all of you in this, in this room do, and NHTSA as well. Um, if you haven't been, I've been down here a number of times, of course, um, NOC TSD um, is who I usually come to visit. And there's a great ecosystem down here right with state federal and locals and ngos and schools and universities and um it's just a it's a force multiplier the partnering that you have and um and we, we benefit from that as well so so just kind of keep it up would be my message uh, there i do have two hats uh, one is to be the commander of the regional maintenance centers i work for navc in that regard my customer is 100 percent the fleet and uh and admiral kitchener in, in particular um, um, I also have a program office side. I'm the director of surface ship maintenance and mod and sustainment. And that, in that hat, uh, PMS 339 is one of my program offices. So a number of you, Bob Kerno is the, is the major program manager. So a number of you will interact with Bob and his team. And it was motivating to see some of the products that he and industry and our warfare centers are, are working on and to see that, uh, that today. Uh, and Admiral Garvin would be my, uh, would be my supported uh, leader in that side from a surface perspective. I have one slide. I don't know if you have it. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a picture. Don't be alarmed. But it's a, it's a wonderful picture. It's a ribbon cutting in San Diego of uh, the newest and the, the best surface um, uh, trainer in the United, United States Navy. And uh, I love it as well because the gentleman to the left is, is uh, Captain Bud Weeks who uh, you know, joined the Navy in 1966, and he's literally probably trained every surface warfare officer in this, in this room. So you have this wonderful blend of technology and world-class training facilities that our Navy and our surface fleet deserves and is getting, uh, thanks to some outstanding leadership uh, by OPNAV and program managers and the fleet requirements. And then, of course, you have experts like, like Bud. So anyway, I'll get to see him tomorrow. I'm excited ab about that up in Newport. I have a couple topics. Um, I'll give you a couple things I'm excited about, and I'll give you maybe two homework assignments just because admirals give homework assignments. So um, point one is, um, uh, I'll echo Swoboss's point. We've reached a tipping point with the use of data and data lakes and um, um, aggregating that data and visualizing it, and, and we're keeping score uh, and measuring performance in ways that I don't think the United States Navy certainly has done ever before. It's really, really um, impressive. And we're using it to predict performance in the future. Think about that. Now this is, of course, what every company does, right? Every good company does, but we're doing it as well. And, uh, and uh, that's not an easy task when you have a complex ecosystem like availability, CNO availabilities or big maintenance availabilities or other aspects of it. Also using it to automate products 
and, uh, and that's game changing because it saves sailor time, it saves civil servant time, it's a, it's a really important piece. And it helps us identify the levers that we need to go after, and so boss alluded to that. And it's not just maintenance data, but it's HR, and it's training, and it's facilities and financials, and it's just, it's really awesome. I think it's game changing, we've embraced it, and we're not, we're not looking back would be, would be point one. Um, I, I am excited also about the use of data in the areas of training and that uh, spent time with the stream folks this morning and you know Aptech and, and a number of other companies and Bob Kerno's team as well and so today we're measuring individual sailor performance um, we're measuring individual watch teams we look at ships we look at strike groups we're starting to integrate that together in a meeting in a meaningful way and it, today it's often used to shape and target additional training but we're starting to get uh, broader than that our ambition is to aggregate even more to trend that data over a career not just maybe a schoolhouse a period of time and or maybe a, the life of a ship or the or, or a deployment cycle right and you can imagine the possibilities right and we're seeing the beginnings of it now a, a watch bill that's been written and it's been automated based on the skill sets of the team and you might pair up just kind of automatically the most capable mentors alongside with the newest members or maybe there's somebody that just got qualified and we're super comfortable with most evolutions but maybe not one or two right so we're getting to a point where where automation and tools like that will help and then you can get to a point where you maybe assign ship x or y to to um, a submarine patrol based on their skills and that watch team right so today we kind of know it instinctively as leaders but uh, data is going to make it just a little bit more objective and I think will drive will e even improved outcomes. And then just think about combining, you know, the human performance and training data with the material condition of the platform, the threat that we're going up against, the weapons loadout, the platform's material condition, right? You can get to a point where we're going to have some really sophisticated uh, decision aids. That's the journey I think I know we're on and it's, it's happening all over the place. And I see it converging in some really wonderful ways. Last thing I'm charged up about is kind of just the, the whole stave, stave uh, concept. Surface training, advanced virtual environment. Many of you know it. Many of you are enabling it to happen. That vision of, with commonality and scalability and the same configuration ashore and afloat and the interfaces defined, the architecture, right? That's, that's game changing. And we're seeing, we're seeing the benefits now. And we're able to scale. Um, we're, um, you know, we're driving down costs, we're getting synergy. Um, it's just really awesome uh, to see it happening. And uh, that picture that I showed up earlier is just a perfect example of that, right? Um, those are just kind of three things I'm really excited about. My homework assignment would just be to encourage kind of, um, this is a kind of a, uh, not a revolutionary thing, but it's something that you're all dealing with in industry and in the Navy, certainly. But, you know, the convergence of supply chain challenges, inflation, pandemics, Chinese owned components, right? I know you're all dealing with that, and I appreciate it um, as an acquisition leader. And, um, and just to continue to be proactive and, and, and forward leaning uh, and innovative as, you, as, you tack, as we tackle those challenges together. I will give you a success story with GDIT and NOC TSD and Bob Kerno's team, a shortage of, of, um, of uh, you know, network switches. Um, it was literally holding up schedule and they imagined a different way, uh, a different product uh, with more capability, a little more expensive, but we ended up uh, bringing back a schedule that was really slipping to the right as a result. So, and it was a little bit of a different configuration and they had to work through the, the technical details, but that was a great example of, you know, the team challenged themselves to think differently. And then the last point would just be, keep working to close what we call the lethality gap, the, the delta between what our training systems are ashore and the warfighting systems that are afloat. Keep working to close that. That's something we'll do together. More commonality, more sim simplicity, doubling down on StaveNet that many of you are aware of, designing in speed and ease of maintenance and modernization. It should be easy to do. It's, it's definitely not there today, as you know. And we still have some challenges with quality as well. Our first pass yield on software is, is not what it needs to be. So anyway, 
the, those are our two asks. We have a lot to be proud of. You're making a difference for the United States Navy. You're making a difference for our sailors. And um, I yield the floor. Look forward to the questions. Uh -oh. Thank you. Bruce? There's always a show off. No, <laughs> um, no uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Rob and, and the NTSA uh, team for allowing me this opportunity. This, too, is my first get set. And I'll tell you, I've seen some eye-watering things out there. But if my eyes start watering while I'm up here, it's not because of that. Um, I was in Columbus, Ohio last week, yeah, for Thanksgiving. And um, yes, I watched that game. Um, so, so, so that's all I'm going to say. I'm a little scarred from that. But <laughs> nevertheless, really happy to be here. Um, my title um, is Enterprise. I, I'm the director of Enterprise Network and Cybersecurity. I support. Uh, Admiral Trussler in his role as the Deputy Department of the Navy Chief Information Officer. So I'm the Navy CIO. I'm a, I wear three other hats also as the Navy's Chief Technology Officer, also as the Navy's Chief Digital Innovation Officer, and as the Navy's Chief Information Security <laughs> Officer. So a lot, lot of different hats, um, four different roles, uh, one, one lonely star, um, but uh, <laughs> a, 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 a really great support team uh, to help pull that off. Um, and I'll say, seriously, you know, the resource sponsor and requirements, I have uh, eight programs that I oversee and manage um, to include three different networks. So there's a float, there's a shore, and then there's this thing called the accepted networks. So that's where there's a lot of our RDT and E, our training networks, the things that are special that don't fit under the enterprise bucket that we still have to make sure we have that cyber security and that resiliency for. So there, there's a lot of challenges there and I'll talk about it here in a bit. But um, yeah, definitely responsible for all of that. I tell you, um, I've been to uh, many uh, war games and we were talking about the fight. Well, we know the fight is already here. And um, as we've see in, seen in some current examples, that non-kinetic fight is, is real. Um, I, in a lot of the war games that I have attended, and uh, this was just repeated in the uh, cyber panel that I just uh, saw with Josh back there, when, um, whenever we're trying to simulate something with cyber, there's like a white card that's handed to you and say, okay, you got a cyber attack. And it's like, well, how do you get to practice and train through with a white card? Like, what is this really? Um, what I'd like to see more of is that is the realism because that's, it really does happen. I think what we need to do is also start to look at the things left of boom. Uh, I would, and I've asked this question several times as I've been sitting through a lot of the different panels. I said, well, you know, where are we investing in our Pre or, or predictive analytics, the things where you can look at those precursor behaviors and anomalies so that you can snip out something before it actually gets there. I haven't seen that type of a simulation or, 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 or things that we've been able to invest in. I've seen many different tools, but I don't know that we've done a good job in that. So I'd like to see more of that. And I understand there's a challenge in replicating uh, the, the, the network. But I think you know, that's what we need to do. Um, yes, we can make it more resilient, but we also have to think a little left. And then we also have to make sure we put some, some real troubles in, 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 in the uh, in real faults in um, the uh, cyber uh, games uh, you know, as we uh, try to move forward to, to make some improvements. Um, yeah, like I said, the networks are high fidelity. I'd like to also see more of the modeling and simulation. Now, we've made some strides. We have an a, a engine lab where we test new solutions using a lot of the model-based uh, systems engineering. But I'd like to see a little more of that because, again, like I said, yeah, the, the fight is already here from that non-kinetic standpoint. And I think we need to do a little better job, uh, we, in, in being, like I said, left to boom on that. So. I got a lot to say. Uh, I won't go on too, too long because uh, I know, uh, you know the, the bewitching hour is approaching, but I definitely look forward to your questions. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for the <laughs> So, getting some good questions. I appreciate that. Keep them coming. Um, there's a couple here that are related to warrior toughness that you talked about. Uh, some are asking, are there any tools or training methods that are available, you know, to enhance tailored, I guess there's folks asking if there's an opportunity to participate in, in that program, you know, in this community. 
Well, absolutely, and uh, I'll tell you, there's there's an app for that. Um, so there actually, there actually is. Uh, although I'll tell you, the app doesn't doesn't make you tougher. It just makes you it helps you understand the program and what it's about, so you understand the lexicon and what these young men and women have been trained to do. And oh, by the way, at the at the very beginning of Warrior Toughness, it was held very close, you know, hold in uh, in Great Lakes. The theory of the case was as we wanted to make sure that our young shipmates got it. In fact, if you ask some of them what warrior toughness is, they won't know because they, they weren't given a title. It was just the way training was conducted. They were taught how to recalibrate. They were taught how to uh, center their, their emotional energy. It's not, it's not a yoga thing. This is, about, this is about human performance. They were taught about visualizing success and they were taught uh, and then they did it. And then they just, they just executed that way. It was held very closely in Great Lakes for fear that it would become some check in the box annual training requirement um, somehow you know watered down and not really just the way we do things not woven into our ethos into our tapestry of what makes a warrior um, well the word got out <laughs> so the people were hearing about it and hearing about the success of it and the desire was to not wait for matriculation into the fleet by natural attrition and all the dinosaurs die off and everybody who has who is uh, assessed had just had the training so it wanted to be accelerated so it's got some direction from from our four-star boss there about how do we not just develop it um, there at boot camp, but how do we sort of give the secondary inoculation, if you will, at A school, C school, just any one of the brick and mortar schools. Both of those are pretty easy because they're both within Netsy. But then the third phase of it is how do you institutionalize it? Uh, because if the <coughs> fleet gets it and it, there's antibodies to it, it will, it will die um, uh, a rather uh, slow death or, or maybe even a quick one. Uh, because it can help the fleet. Um, and I will tell you, I'm super happy and super proud that the type commanders all kind of jumped on uh, the, the, uh, the idea of how do we make our individual sailors and therefore in aggregate our teams tougher. Uh, probably most notable of which is, is Sir Flant uh, dove right in with both feet even before we had the schoolhouses really stood up. So we stood up in East Coast, West Coast, so San Diego and Norfolk so that we could teach the schoolhouses that were there as well as the fleet um, and sort of keep the purity of the, of the design. So the theory of the case, it's mind, body, and soul. So it's a, it's a team of a, a psychiatrist, a chaplain, and a warrior. And the warrior can be of whatever flavor. And it's one of the reasons it's sort of TICOM-centric is to relate to said warrior probably needs to be somebody that you can relate to and see yourself as um, in, in sort of the description of the, of the anecdotes and the vignettes. So, um, you know, I, I can listen to a Navy SEAL talk about uh, the experiences of battle, but I, I, I'm an aviator. I don't, that's not, you know, that's not the, the fight that I'm going to be in necessarily. So that's why the TICOM uh, central nature of it. And so in the case of surface warfare, the surface warfare officers that have experience in various um, parts of the world doing various things um, will be a part of that, that training continuum. How can this community get involved? It's, it's, there's not a lot of simulation there. There's not a lot of, uh, other than just straight up training there. Um, and so if, you, if you've got ideas in that regard, happy to, to listen to you and happy to take them on. It's very, very simple. It's very, very basic, but it's very, very fundamental. And again, to my mind, it all goes back to how do we make sure that these young men and women are best prepared for what they might face? Hopefully that answers the question. If not, I'm happy to take a follow on. I think the only thing I'd add is there are some things if, um, you know, you wearables and human performance, we do a lot of fatigue management um, pilots and studies on our ships. And I think that helps with some of the things that, uh, that Pete's talking about as well as we monitor their performance and we teach them those skills so that when they experience those things happening, they know what to do. And that allows us to put them in situations and then show them what they're doing. I know some of you have all been working on that. I saw some of that technology today, but that's something that we continue to explore um, and, and take advantage of. Hey, uh, I think hey. that there's a lot of human performance companies here. I see one for sure, but there's a real desire to try to model human performance as well as measure it. And I think a lot of the challenges involve what attributes are you trying to put into yeah. the bucket? So. Can you do leadership or character? Or, you know, if these are important to the, the, the human that you're trying to shape, uh, how do you how do you put that into the box and, and make it work? Uh, 
So thank you for that. I want to ask a little, little risky here because next thing I'll know I'll get taskers. But um, but um, so Pete, how do you how do you measure effectiveness of that warrior toughness? Exactly. Are you, yeah. So are we still working through that? Exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's kind of you know to your point and actually and it is homework. Um, yeah. is, <laughs> so how do you measure it and then in it, with a degree of certainty that that is actually the thing that you that makes someone tough, right? Uh, so I remember the discussion with uh, then VCNO uh, Lesher. And he's like, so how do you know? And of course, me being a smart aleck pilot, um, I immediately answer, well, short of a war, we won't. And then he's, you know, the finger starts coming out, I'm like, but, 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 no, we're not, we're not doing that. But we can, we can indirectly measure. Yeah. We can direct, you know, by inference, things around that, that which we wish to measure. Um, that's where we are now. But I think we can go further down that road. And I, I would love to hear the ideas uh, from all those here, including you. Okay. I don't, I don't have the answer, actually. That's why, <laughs> why I, <asked. laughs> I like this tasker management. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. This, is, this is a good thing. We like to have discussions. So the uh, Amos Small, you were talking about information warfare, and a lot of what you're talking about sounded internal. So is, are we working both sides of this fence, or uh, are we trying to fix things that, that we are you know, internally working? And is there a, what, what, how do you play on the other side of the fence in terms of information warfare? You mean in terms of like with industry? No, with the threat. Or oh, with the threat. Uh, we dominate it. <laughs> I mean, what I, what I was listing were just sort of my priorities as commander. Um, and it's all about getting ahead of, you know, we, we um, you know, and looking at, I, I mentioned sort of the, the whole world has been, you know, again, many industries have been taken over by software companies and things like that. And we still struggle along with a lot of, you know, very, you know, people still want to bring computers to ships and things like that and figure out where to put them and we already have plenty, right? Um, instead of going to these sort of digital platform um, type concepts, our adversaries didn't grow up, you know, having to build their own computers like we did in the Navy. You know, they've, they've been able to take advantage of an incredible uh, commercial marketplace and modern software delivery methods that we are having to learn ourselves how to do that. And so that's why it's a, it's a big emphasis on changing ourselves in order to be able to deliver at speed and scale to pay, you know, outpace the threat. Yes, and I'll just add, as an information warfare officer, that's what this pen is, for those that don't know, um, that's comprised of the information professionals, um, that's a designator, and then a cryptologic warfare officers, along with the intelligence officers, the oceanographic officers as well, and then we have a space cadre. So we've assembled ourselves to, to, be, strength, to, to be stronger in the information warfare domain. And um, I think coming together, we're, we're looking at, you know, how, how, how do we make sure that we're continuing to collaborate and, and, and really, you know, take on that, that warfare domain. So, um, and I know there's all sorts of uh, tools and, and I know there's a lot, I mean, we work with a lot of uh, industry to kind of help us to make sure we're getting the, you know, what, 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 are, they, what are they doing out in the in, in, in industry? in this um in this in domain uh, to strengthen it so we were, we're trying to partner so we look for those opportunities to continue to do that as well within the information warfare community okay thank you so a couple of questions related to firefighting training in reference to a couple of uh, fires at, at sea so can anybody give us a sense for are we changing it making it better redoing it uh, better emphasis i don't uh, I, I'll start on that one, and um, I think so. From the actual training perspective, um, yes, we were looking harder at individual training, and, uh, and and Pete supports us on that one through the trainers that we have, and then through our team trainers. A lot of the emphasis, quite frankly, though, has gone into um, you know what we talked about earlier a little bit was uh, a little bit of watch bill management, ensuring we have proficiency in place. Um, you know, are, is, is the training being done correctly? Are we, when we do training, uh, what are we learning from it? How are we self-assessing and self-correcting? Because if you look at some of the fires that we've had, 
and you drill down into what the ships were doing, they were doing training. They were doing training every day like they were required to do. Uh, what they weren't doing was taking the lessons from that training that day and then doing it, you know, taking that, correcting, and doing it the next day so they made sure they were correcting their mistakes and then passing that on to the, the duty sections further down. So there was only, there was very limited training. Um, and that's not to say it was all ships, but there was a variance. There were some ships that were doing it very well and others that were not. And so I thought it was somewhat interesting today, and it kind of goes, there's a, a couple of different groups, and this goes to the broader aspect of, um, you know, doing our PBED, doing our, our briefs and then our debriefs, and then collecting that enormous amount of information. Firefighting is somewhat simpler, but if you look at uh, a ship that goes through SWAT and does some uh, anti-submarine warfare or an air warfare exercise, and then taking that data and crunching it down into something usable quickly to actually show the performance to the individual uh, is, is something where we're looking really hard at. I, you know, and so those are sort of the things I, I find useful for training. Uh, obviously, we want trainers. We just um, we're always looking to upgrade our trainers and, and prevent sail or pre have give sailors a perspective of a more complex uh, fire. Um, but I think also what we need to make sure is that we're giving them the tools every day to learn and self-correct, self-assess, and get better at what they're doing and then proliferate that across the force. Um, and, and those are some things we would look at investing in. I don't know if you wanted to add, Pete. You do a yeah, lot Yeah, Boston, no, I appreciate it. Um, so on the individual training side, um, very much focused on this, both as a result of of Bonner Marshard and the Major Fires Review, as well as uh, uh, prior to that, uh, Fitzgerald and McCain on the damage control side of the house. And, and I alluded to it earlier, one of the things that NETSI has a responsibility for um, in a very strong sense of that responsibility uh, is what is a basically trained sailor capable of once they uh, go out to the fleet, just every single sailor. Um, to, to my mind, again, this is where I stray into personal opinion, um, I think that it should be every single sailor. I don't care what rate they are. They should be able to save their ship uh, from fire and damage control uh, perspectives. Um, now, that, that may be unobtainium, right? So let's find out where, where it does make sense. Where I'm personally involved is at Great Lakes at our boot camp. Our trainer there um, has, done us, has done us a lot of years of great service. Uh, but, but she's tired. She's old and she's, uh, she's cracking. Um, and so she needs, she needs to be replaced. Um, in, in looking at the business case uh, um, and the ROI on, well, it's a, fam it's a familiarization trainer, so they don't go into a fire. They don't actually charge their, their breathing apparatus. Uh, does it make sense uh, as an investment to, to make it a level one trainer where they could actually go into a fire and they could actually go into a flooded compartment and have to do damage control, et cetera, et cetera? So that's, those are all things under, under discussion, all again with the mind of how do we make sure that our Navy is best prepared to fight and win uh, our nation's wars. So still a little bit pre-decisional there, but uh, a couple of hints towards what we're trying to get at. Um, and then make sure that we can use those fleet concentration area trainers for what, what Swoboss talked about, which is that team training, that advanced firefighting, and really uh, elevating our game. I think one, one fundamental that we, we all have to be reminded, though, they need to be able to do their training in the gear that's on the ship. Yes, sir. Uh, right. and, yes, sir. And that's really important. My, you know, you get all of A triple F now is a really bad thing on the radio. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so in terms of training on the ship or training at sea, a lot of the when we were out there, we didn't have trainers. You know, flight trainers. We kind of faked it or whatever. But but now we've got these small scale trainers that are know, pretty cost effective and they're also pretty small. They don't take a lot of space. But as we see with Project Avenger, and, you know, they, they are really good vehicles for people to go get repetitions or reflies or retrain on areas that they need to work on. So do you see a, a potential use for these small scale trainers at sea on in the surface world? I do. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of um, applicability. I mean, for one, if you look at, um, you know, one of the things we've been trying to crack lately is, uh, you know, how do we continue to do high-end training forward 
um, <clears throat> when we don't want to show our adversary what we're doing. And, uh, and that all goes to, you know, LVC and, and small trainers that we can use in our CICs or in our on, uh, TFCCs on the carrier, our CDCs. I, I think that's important, and that's something we're really uh, leaning forward on lately. We've done some pilots on it, but I do think there's a lot of applicability. Or, you know, we have some destroyers now that were built with, um, you know, sh uh, ship handling simulators into the bridge, and, and we've started using those. So, uh, yeah, I do think there's some, okay. some great applicability there. That's, that's great. I think that the small-scale training business is even very small, you know, trying to, even you take it to education, right, where the sailors are trying to get yeah. a degree or they're yeah. trying to, you know, the availability of that kind of interaction with a syllabus of some form, I think it uh, helps them and it also... Well, it goes, to, it goes to two tenets of ready, relevant learning, right? The time of need and, right. and at the place of need, right? So where they are, delivered in the right way, it's actually three, I guess. So, uh, you know, if they, if they can do rules of the road, reps and sets while they're on some downtime, wherever right. they happen to be. Right. Um, so I, I do see a lot of applicability of it, all the way from basic fundamentals training all the way up to, to, high, end. to yeah, high end. I agree. High end. Okay, so the uh, question for Ms. Admiral Kitchener, that there's a seemingly increasing number of underwater vehicles or autonomous vehicles being associated with the surface forces. And can you discuss that a little bit or tell, fill us in on? Yeah, we're doing a lot of work. Um, we have two, right now we have two kind of focal points. One is uh, the work that Vice Admiral Cooper has been doing out in Fifth Fleet, um, using a lot of um, sail vehicles and, and uh, unmanned surface vessels. Uh, and, and what they're doing there primarily is, is and, and they use a coalition, you know, they're using the allies uh, and they're working to get a, um, a maritime picture. And so that's one thing they're doing. Most of, most of the work right now is all at the unclassified level, um, but I think it's, uh, it's shown some great progress. We've been able to bring in a lot of, he's been able to bring in a lot of different people and countries into it. Uh, and a matter of fact, we're actually leveraging some of his work that's been so successful for early command opportunities for some of our, our younger surface warfare officers. The other focal point we have is um, out in San Diego, uh, where we have our, our USVs, um, and we've been using those. We're still working through a lot of the um, uh, autonomy, you know, with the rolls of the road and some of the uh, dur durability or durations with some of the material, the engines. Um, but we've been had a lot of success, um, you know, on the with some of the mission packages. Like we've done some good ASW with one. Uh, we've also have some, um, you know, at a higher classification, some gear that helps us do some ISR and T. Uh, and so it's definitely a growth industry. And, and one of the challenges has been where do you control them from? Uh, and so we've done it from different platforms, different ships. We've done it from ashore. Um, and we continue to work on an expeditionary capability, but um, yeah, there's a definitely a growth industry there in, um, in uh, unmanned, uh, unmanned vehicles, whether it's in the air, under the sea, and uh, we've also used extensively on some off of our LCS platform some of the um, you know the EOD UUVs mm -hmm. for mine hunting, uh, which is uh, AI has been uh, a significant uh, advancement in uh, you know detecting mine-like objects. I mean, right. it's, it's game changing. So a lot, a lot of good work there. Well, AI is another topic. We'll save that for just a little later. So, I, yeah, no, so if I could go to that, just, yeah. um, you know, part of the project overmatch is how do you extend the operational architecture out to handle unmanned systems? And one of the things that we've been exploring through, uh, through an OT, a consortium called IWRP, and hopefully maybe some of you are involved, is a is a proving ground for mission autonomy. And again, the focus being on software and <coughs> algorithms that provide mission autonomy, not the vehicle autonomy. We want to make sure that to the point of where do you control these from, we want to be able to control them from wherever they need to be controlled. In fact, we want them to be controlled by the mission that they need to perform. Surveil this area, machines, go figure it out. That's what we're uh, aiming for. So we, we're down selecting to a couple of companies and we're going to have a, um, Again, a proving ground, so you can bring your wares, and we can measure the performance of the mission autonomy uh, capability. Okay. So 
So I have one for Real Mohan. So it talks about cybersecurity. And the question, and you probably understand more than I will, it says, how can you improve the feedback loop regarding cybersecurity actions when a new control is pushed out, which causes a lack of capability mm -hmm. or degradation? Uh, it doesn't seem, it's, the statement is it doesn't seem to get back to the top so that the policies can either be revised or adjusted. Now, thank you for that question. That's been something that has been uh, challenging uh, for a while. Um, we're, we're trying to, and I, and I did talk to um, some industry partners here about a continuous monitoring effort. That's what we need to get more into. Um, so, and this is a part of our overall, overall risk management framework uh, reform. Um, that we're trying to get through. So I think we need to have more of a continuous monitoring. That is something we are working on. I've been working with Fleet Cyber Command um, to make sure we, we, we get that right. But no, that, that's a great question because we don't have that loop right now and, and things have been kind of segmented and we, we've missed some things. So I appreciate that question and I uh, look forward to if you have some, some thoughts on how we can get that, that feedback loop uh, better, uh, please. Um, Connect with me afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Rebel Hines got another one okay. here. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about networks, and uh, we're all trying to get together as four four services plus. And how, to what degree are are you able to interface with the joint world on networks? Uh, because some seem to be going in different directions. You're absolutely right, um, but I do, and you know, as, as as the Navy Department of the Navy includes the Marine Corps, so of course we're we are collaborating, collaborating. But also the DOD Department of Defense um, Chief Information Office also has a, you know a, a collaboration venue where we talk, and the, and all the military departments are represented there. So we all have the the same challenges, especially with cybersecurity and just, you know, how to make our networks more resilient and all of that. So that's where we, we have an opportunity to kind of share information and to, to, to look and work towards more of an enterprise solution. So it does exist and I, I, I probably, um, I, I know that I want to do a better job with reaching out to Air Force more, but I do, you know, look, 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 at, look at holistically, you know, what, what is the, what, where are we going from a joint perspective? Um, the uh, person that I relieved, her name is Admiral Breyer Joyner, she is the Deputy J6. So I talked to her, um, who, who's just downstairs <laughs> working in, in the joint realm, to make sure that I, I keep apprised of, of what we're doing and how we can better um, leverage and, um, and, and help each other out in, in this uh, challenging uh, world. So no, thank you. We are talking, um, but yes, we, we, we definitely can do better because there's so many solutions out there and I used to say before I got to this level, well, why don't we all just use the same thing? Why are we on NMCI? Why are they on this? How come I can't find somebody in the domain? And then you, you get, you know, and you go a little higher and you're like, oh, wow, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges. So, um, but, but we are trying to get better in that area. So thank you. So thank you for that. It, it is hard work. I, last year I talked to Sino about Project Overmatch and we had a discussion of about what he's trying to do, and uh, he's very excited about it. And one of the one of the discussion items re related to the fact that they were trying to make an operational sort of architecture mm -hmm. that would, you know, command and control. And I asked them, how do we train to that yeah. architecture, yeah. or can it be on the JADC2 mm -hmm. solution? Do you have any? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I have a few. <laughs> there you go. But it's specifically about training. Well, or? it was. We have. We simulate real world. I mean, that's yeah. the normal. So a lot of times when we have a command and control system, we have to simulate the command right. and control system. But he was going much higher in terms yeah. of this command and control, and and trying to integrate gaming and you know a lot yeah. of high end things that were that would be difficult if we weren't either on that command and control network or mm -hmm. very close to it, we wouldn't be able to train to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 
so you know I think it kind of cuts to you know what what command and control let's get the command part right first right what command are we talking about so you know we once you get your command structure set we've been focusing a lot on at the component level for example um, yeah, um, you know maybe a joint force command or, or uh, 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 you know but at that sort of four star level component command and then um, they're building in sort of joint infrastructure in there um, just because we know it's it's got to be a joint fight so for example pack fleet has you know joint joint elements inside their cycle and so that's how you get to this you know joint all domain command and control but you know the CNO is up there talking about like how do you train model and sim all the C2 like the decision making system right I have my command structure now how do I actually control forces and that's where the naval operation architecture comes in yeah. um, but I, I actually walking around out here I did find a couple people that are that are in the sort of sort of real-time wargaming type scenarios right that you want to get to right I, I generated a bunch of COAs now let's build in time into our processes that we can game those out which one is actually better what would the reaction be how can I you know close that loop things like that I don't know if that's what he was talking about but um, that's well, what I that's what we're working on because um, we have we have our own architectures within the simulation business and they struggle uh, because in some cases they're not allowed to be connected to an operational yeah. thing, mm -hmm. right? And, right? And so now you're, you really have an air gap in, in your capability to train. And in many cases, like Aegis, they won't let you train on the real thing because of the, the liabilities potentially of doing something. So how how we solve but I think that? a lot of that stuff, like you're seeing the systems that are being able to go to sea now, right? And so, and I think right. that's kind of our focus at least what I talked about with this whole software and hardware thing once you get a system out there that you can reconfigure and it's and it's you can put it in the space where people actually work you can train right there maybe it's an air gap it's a different system but but there's so there's so much more in uh, you know portability and all of the senses of portability that we can deliver that kind of training and um, and even the simulation okay. I'd, I'd like to see more blurriness between training and yeah. real world yeah, yeah. I could imagine, yeah. I used to be the Aegis Shore program manager, so I could imagine yeah. that site in Dahlgren maybe providing a third watch team mm -hmm. when the folks forward needed one, right? So we, I think we have to get to a point where we're not two separate total enterprises. Yeah. We gotta have the right firewalls in place, yeah. but we ought to be able to shift mm -hmm. if we need to. Yeah. That would I agree, right. I agree. So we, we are great advocates for that. We love to train on the equipment that's, that's there. You have to have embedded training in there that has the safeguards. Convergence. Uh, but some of the some of the other things that we have to question is why do we have separate networks for these things? Yeah. Why are why can't That's these right. things? It's all ones and zeros flowing over the same mm -hmm. cables, right? Why do we we we've created this whole infrastructure around training mm -hmm. and around operations and then we say we can't connect these things up. That's that's stuff we're doing to ourselves. Right. It's not yeah. a technical problem. Yeah. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and training yeah. and training yeah. ranges are different than testing That's ranges. That's right. Yeah. And I don't understand that either. Yeah. Uh, but and, uh, but it, it, we've had a culture of exactly. separating the two for security reasons or whatever. I, you know, the, a lot of the a lot of the training systems are not as rigorous in terms of cybersecurity or whatever. So it's it's a problem. But we we yeah. see. You need to go to see if you can train at sea. That's that's what you need to do. If you can use the the real network in some way, uh, you know, dash one or something, and so that you're but you're there. And you're using the same architecture. I think that's a very powerful thing to bring everybody together. So, kind of working off of that, uh, Emil Kitchener, what where do you see in the training business, say, out in uh, you know, when, when you go to deploy and, and train out in the, in the op area, uh, where do you see LVC and an LVC architecture being able to really enhance training at sea and uh, maybe save a lot of money on assets that are out sort of making uh, radar dots, things like that? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, we've embraced it. And um, I think one of the just a couple of examples. Um, one, just from a surface community perspective, uh, where actually we 
I, I think for a while we were probably leading the LVC um, you know, proliferation. But we use it now in our basic training phase where we do our tier one certifications, our tier two certifications. In the basic phase for a ship are focused on, um, you know, air defense, ASW, sort of the, the, the higher end individual unit training. Uh, and we've been able to use LVC for that and it's been able, it's allowed us to in, uh, reduce the time that we train uh, and prepare the crew much faster. So we'll send the ship to sea for, you know, four to six weeks with a couple other ships and then we can get the training completed uh, in about, you know, half the time we used to. Uh, during Comp 2Xs, again, it's the only way we can generate the threat that we think we're going to encounter. Uh, and so LVC is a very much a large part of what we do. We've, we've been able to use it in San Diego. We've been able to use it uh, forward, you know, uh, out in the Guam area. We continue to build out the architecture. We use it extensively up at, uh, you know, Fallon. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, it is the future. and, and uh, we're using it a lot right now, Good. and uh, yeah, it's it's been I've a big seen success. Some examples where within the training, you actually get targets on the real equipment. It actually stimulates all of our systems. Right. So a slick 32 operator, you know, see with block six, you're going to get the actual threat. Uh, we see it on our radars. Our uh, our Aegis system is stimulated by it. it. It works really well, and on the aviation side. Uh, even the pilots, you can have pilots up at Fallon sitting in the tubs, and at the same time, you can have your you know mm -hmm. pilots from the air wing flying off the carrier, all going against the same threat. Really, really powerful tool. Right. So within within that particular topic of training at sea, we've got a lot of complex tactics going on with uh, missile defense, and so. Or how are we organized? I mean, how do we organize to do that kind of training? Because it's a lot of it has to be done in a simulator. Um, say ballistic missile defense. Is that all done? It is. We'll, we'll break it up into different compartments. Right now, we've we've tried to. Con it's it's a good question because right now we do it a little bit differently uh, from East Coast to West Coast. So mm -hmm. West Coast, we've consolidated a lot of the equipment in one one spot at uh, TAC Trade Group Pack. Uh, and we're still trying to build that out in the um, on the East Coast and the, using the same infrastructure. But uh, all the training's central from there, or we can actually run, you know, off of the carrier, we can run a BMD exercise for the force. Uh, or the ATG guys can run it through their center. So I think it's allowed us to, to get in kind of to what Doug was talking about before. We are able to remote in from different training sites, either afloat or ashore. And, um, and there, there's work to be done, but it's, uh, I mean, it, it has gone leaps and bounds since I've watched it over the last five years. Right. Uh, pretty significant. Let me add, add something. You know, four, I guess three or four assignments ago, I was the U.S. Um, 06 point of contact to the Maritime Theater Missile Defense <laughs> Forum. And there's been a steady stream since 2015 to present of increasingly realistic actual BMD targets in outer space. I remember having to call the National Security Council to say, hey, just want to make sure you know, we're going to fire a ballistic missile into outer space and suit it down in Northern Europe, right? Just, so we're really trying to up our game. The fleets are leading this now. It started as an MDA kind of led thing. Then it really became the right spot, which is the Navy. Um, and it's multinational too. So I've, I've been impressed with that. Um, kind of the evolution and the sophistication and complexity of that, of those efforts. Right. And it's air and missile defense and hypersonic targets and all Ooh, those kinds of things that you would yeah. want. There we right. go now. So I appreciate it. Uh, I, that's really hard work and I know that, especially when you're doing complex uh, yes. over the shoulder kind of stuff and trying to pull airplanes together with ships. Uh, and the networks are a huge enabler of that, right? right? And those are right. complex, especially multinational right. networks. So uh, I have a question about get real, get better. So there, there actually is three or four, just looking for the context of what that means. Um, you know, or give us an example. <laughs> I, I think the best way to describe get real, get better and what we're trying to do uh, in the Navy right now is we, we, one, we want to be, we want to be better at self-assessment. We want to be better at correcting uh, 
uh, you know, our mistakes, which really equates to we're trying to be a better learning organization. And, and so you heard me talk a little bit about uh, PBED and debriefs and understanding, you know, what the data is telling us and learning from it. And then we really want to try to get a common lexicon across the entire Navy, across all the different communities on how we problem solve. Uh, you know, so that we're all approaching things from the same way, so that when we share information, uh, or you know, when I have a problem in, in, in my community and I come to Admiral Garvin and say, hey, look, the solution to this is through training. Here's the analysis we did. Um, over to you to, to give me a solution to it. And he knows exactly, and his folks know exactly what we're talking about. But, we, and, but it is all tied towards getting better at war fighting. I mean, it is all tied to make sure that we're not going to repeat our mistakes. We're going to learn from them. We're going to continue to learn at a rate uh, that keeps us ahead of our enemy. You know, I always use that. I, I use this all the time, and I kind of stole it from CNO, but it's probably worth talking about now. <laughs> and so if you look at Ukraine, you know, and what's happened there in the war there, and you, and you try to look at the similarities between uh, what's going on there and, and perhaps what we may face in the Western Pacific, you have a large army. You know, a lot of tanks and helicopters and aircraft. If a much smaller one that is using missiles and drones instead of tanks and uh, helicopters. Uh, but most importantly, what are they doing? They're observing, they're learning, they're assessing if their tactics worked, and they're kicking the crap out of the Russians. And so there's a lesson there for all of us. And then perhaps maybe that is. You know, you know, what I would use as an example of get real, get better. It's like, okay, let's understand, you know, what we've done wrong. Let's kind of fix it. Let's look at our weapons. It's about war fighting design, right, is what the Ukrainians are doing. And I think that's what we as a Navy are trying to achieve, is to be smarter and, uh, and, and understand what we're doing and then continue to learn at a faster rate than the enemy. Well, that's, that's a, great, a great definition or example. Uh, what else is the Ukraine conflict, Russian conflict? I mean, it's, the tactics weren't kind of different than we expected. We've seen a lot of new capabilities that kind of came out of somebody's garage probably eight months ago, like uh, kamikaze drones, things like that. We got people, Iranians, giving drones. I mean, there's swapping uh, stuff that you wouldn't normally put into some country's order of battle. Uh, does this? How, how is the, the Navy kind of going through this assessment to say, what, where is that going to, where do we need to just fire a little bit in terms of drones or small scale munitions? You know, if, you, if the Iranians, for example, decided to go take all that, uh, what would that do? How would we react to that? I'll start, and then I'm going to turn it over to Doug because I think it fits into what he's doing. It is is what you've seen is, um, you know, one, uh, an ability, an ally's ability to collect a lot of information, right, mm -hmm. and quickly uh, get it out to its forces that are very mobile and, uh, and nimble, uh, but very lethal. And, uh, and I think that's a lesson for us, but I think that's a lesson perhaps <coughs> We already learned in that Admiral Small over here is spending a lot of time with his folks working on. Yeah, I would just say that you know what what you've seen is the sort of the oper operationalization in wartime of a lot of the things that the Task Force 59 has been demonstrating for a couple of years now that smaller, attributable systems in larger numbers have in this in Ukraine's strategic effect in war. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge learning point. And so that's, the, that's what we're saying is, hey, that's why our focus is so much on software and algorithms, because the vehicle, vehicles, we want to get those from the commercial industry, right? We, don't, we shouldn't be in the, in the game of building our own sail drones and things like that. There are plenty of these things out there for other purposes. What we care about is how to make the missions themselves uh, autonomous, robotic autonomous systems, so AI, um, AI-driven um, uh, behaviors that can be synthesized into an effect with smaller vehicles. That's what you're seeing. Strategic effect from small vehicles. Yeah, hopefully you don't run out, which is another problem set. So the last of this kind of question is goes to Emil um, Garvin, and it's 
a theoretical thing, but it says this, a significant amount of money and uh, goes into training and education uh, to accomplish uh, the task, you know, increase the task management of a young naval officer who is earning their warfare, especially wings, dolphins, cutlasses, et cetera, et cetera. Could the Navy recognize these accomplishments by awarding master's degrees? Absolutely. So um, it's a great question. Did one of you guys put it in? Okay. Yeah. Um, That's a good question. It sounds like a question one of my guys might throw throw for me as a softball. Um, so, so we have this uh, Navy Cool is one of the credentialing uh, uh, things that we run through Netsy, and actually, um, so I, I commend that. That's mostly on the um, on the enlisted side of the house, getting them uh, credentials that that uh, don't just matter in the Navy, but they matter out to the outside world. Um, uh, you know, so certainly the opportunity to to uh, provide credit where credit's due is, is there. And again, if there are specific ideas on the subject where folks are not getting credit for, for work done, um, I'm all ears about that. Uh, again, it goes to not just uh, ensuring that they have the credentialing that they would desire, but also it goes to retention, it goes to, it goes to uh, benefits. I mean, it, these are things that accrue to young men and women, reasons for them to, uh, to join our service. So um, all ears, uh, but yes. The okay. short answer is yes. All right. Maybe not in the specific way you're asking, but we'll, we'll talk after. Get, get, yeah. get together. Yep. So in the small time we have left, I, I just would like uh, each of you to give what you would say as a charge to industry on how they can help you. What you know, it could be time, products, uh, help, intellectual help, solving problems, whatever. So start with you, Emma Kitchener. I would say. Um, continue to ask us hard questions. I think the connection between uh, industry and the fleet, the force, uh, needs to be really strong for all the reasons that we talked about here today. Uh, I, I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. I, I wish I knew all the answers, um, but I think they're coming, and I appreciate the hard work you're doing. I think one of the things we need to be aware of um, is, uh, and, and it always comes to me in the form of software, whether it's uh, machinery control systems, combat systems, or what you all work on, which are simulators, uh, is that sometimes we just need good enough. I don't necessarily need the next, uh, you know, great uh, breakthrough. We'll be ready for that, but what we need to do is field systems that we can use now to sort make our force ready now, and then give us the opportunity to add that later. And, uh, and I, that applies to any kind of software. And because if you don't, then, and we don't do that together, then it could limit the capability we could put forward when we need it. And so, but, but I appreciate all your efforts. I think there's a lot more work to be done in human performance and, um, and, uh, and training and the readiness of our sailors. But I think we're on the right trajectory and, and uh, I appreciate all your work doing that. And um, I look forward to working with most of you in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So a, a charge to industry, it's also a charge to ourselves uh, in the Navy because I think we very much have to partner in this, in this uh, idea. So walking around the floor uh, the last couple of years, um, increasingly I've, I've noticed a degree to which the industry is harmonized and, and not homogenized in ideas. And what I, what I mean by that is I, I noticed um, happily that several of the industry partners um, partnered up with the idea of providing the solution that the Navy uh, needs or, in, or uh, the military needs. So I, I please continue to do that. What I was concerned about the first time I walked the floor is it seemed like there was an awful lot of towers of battle out there, uh, that there was no talking between and no ability to talk between. And then if you were t to be interested in that one tower of battle, well now you just bought that tail and you have to always go back to that. There's no open architecture, there's no, there's no uh, standards there. now. Here's where the you know being you know looking in the mirror here. This is where the Navy we need to make sure that we write tight requirements. We talk about the architectures that we need. We talk about what we uh, what we're asking you to do, and so please help us uh, be very clear in what we're asking for. And if if it's not clear, demand that of us, um, and just keep that tight partnership. Also true with academia too. So so it, I, I do do view it as a very much a virtuous partnership here. Um, and just really appreciate it. Appreciate being invited. Thank you. Thank you. So if you go to the, spend a lot of time on the floor, the call for standards is, is um, it's a 
almost every booth because they're making things and not sure if it's going to connect and they, they want to have it connect but there's a lot of different ideas so out there as you it'll said. connect <laughs> it will connect, connect. Oh. <laughs> I, I get asked that all the time hey we need a standard of that we have so many standards out there pick one and let's figure up using yeah. again best of commercial technologies figure up how to make these things uh, connect hey my thing with industry is it, unless there's a solicitation on the street for a very specific thing we want to communicate I don't want there to be any knowledge gap between what the Navy needs and what you provide and, and I want you to deeply understand our problem so that you can, uh, you know, come with a solution. That's, that's the name of the game. Um, so please connect. We have industry, you know, multiple industry days. N2 N6 just had an industry day. I've had multiple classified project overmatch industry days. Uh, POC4I has industry days. We want you to see what it is that we need. Um, we don't know everything that's available. I mean, I tried to kind of paint a picture of we're kind of stuck in the 19, I'll say, I'll say 90s, you know, maybe 80s. We're, we really don't know what all is going on. That floor, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming walking around out there. Um, you really need to communicate with us what it is that you have available. Please connect. It drives my team crazy. I'm on LinkedIn. I will get you connected to whoever you need <laughs> in uh, NAV or I put up my contact information all the time. Um, so industry days, LinkedIn, however you got to do it, please get connected. We have a lot of means of contracting, um, whether it's, you know, that we have a tons of authorities, whether they're uh, small business type arrangements or uh, OTs or, you know, basic, you know, IDIQ, MAC, whatever, con we have a lot of ways to get, uh, to uh, be able to get to the right business arrangement, okay? So that, that's, that's our main thing. We have to approach this with, uh, uh, from our part with a lot of humility. We just, we don't know what's available. We know what problems we have to solve. We want you to help us solve them, okay? Thank you. I actually spoke a little bit earlier on it. I'll just reinforce the, the partnering piece. I, I gave this community, this ecosystem, this uh, Orlando area a compliment um, because I met it, but I also love it and I want to see more of it, right? So I was trying to practice affirmative leadership by my statement. Um, so keep doing that. I really do think it's a force multiplier. It really is. Trying to create that in, uh, in the maintenance uh, and modernization world as well. Um, Stavenet is fundamentally a, a standard. It's a vision. And I want to commend those that put it together. We should double down on it, uh, to be honest. We could take it to the next uh, level. I would offer um, it's together doing that, right? Because none of us by ourselves has, has the, the total answer. And then I just talked kind of about cost performance and schedule, right? Just got to be relentless. I'm an acquisition leader, so got to be relentless in that regard. I fall short every day in that regard, so it's with humility when I say it here. But uh, we've, we've got to lean forward. We've got to anticipate. We've got to, um, we've got to deliver better collectively. Uh, I see many examples of awesomeness. And um, I'm really positive about that. I see many areas where we got it. We got to do better, and uh, so we'll just we'll be persistent on it. So that would be my message: is partnering, the standards, Stavenet, double down on it. Just continued emphasis on cost, performance, and schedule. Tracy, awesome. Well, thank you once again. This was fun. Um, I will say first, I want to apologize. I didn't. I, I may have forgotten about intelligence officers when I was. Uh, crafting the information warfare so intelligence officers are a part of that so my apologies uh, brothers and sisters um, but uh, I, I think this is fabulous I think by having um, you know things like it's sec and in any type of like we said we just had a, a industry day um, for information warfare but continuing to invite us to these things I, I, I sometimes I know our schedules get full but again being able to communicate and know what is truly out there um, I, you know, cybersecurity is everybody's uh, issue. It's not just a, a Navy issue. Um, in fact, in October, we, we, uh, we, we celebrated Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and I said, see yourself in cyber. So with that, um, like I mentioned earlier, I want to be more proactive. Um, I want to, you know, uh, know what's out there that, that really teases out those predictive analytics 
how we can you know, get really uh, left of boom. So just continue to communicate, continue to let us know what's going on. Uh, and, and then like we already talked about, those partnerships are extremely important. So, and thank you for your time and being here today. All right, thank you very much. So the first thing I'd like to thank the panel for your time. I mean, you all came a long way in some cases and spent a great hour and a half. I know I kept you too long, but uh, we really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Thank you.